Have you ever been to church and in the middle of the pastor's message had a question and you wanted to raise your hand and say, pastor, pastor, can you tell me more about that? But you simply knew it wasn't appropriate. I know all of us have probably had that experience. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever been to church? And maybe it's a large church with people all around you and yet you yourself felt lonely? Let me ask you another question. Have you ever been to church when people were exuberant in worship, they were having a great day and you were thinking to yourself, am I the only one here today that is struggling with what I'm struggling with? Hey, if that's you, you're not alone. I guarantee you, everyone who's ever attended church has had those feelings. Now, I wanna take you to the book of Acts because in the early church, there were two different kinds of gatherings for believers, and it's clear. And I believe we're gonna bring some clarity to you today concerning how we church and how we do it in a most significant and biblical way. In Acts chapter two, verse 42, there's recorded for us now the growth and the movement of the early church. Here's what it says, starting with verse 42, they devoted themselves. First of all, notice they were devoted to this. They were devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching to the fellowship and to the breaking bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonder signs performed by the apostles. I mean, things were going quite extraordinary at this time. All the believers were together and they had everything in common. So there's a lot of unity coming out of that upper room and day of Pentecost. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. Now watch this, in the temple courts, they broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. And there's the distinction right there. So in the early church, there were two kinds of gatherings. The larger gathering gathered in the temple that would be kind of like modern day weekend service. But throughout the week, people gathered in their homes. And that's where they really grew together. That was foundational for them. And so we're in a series here at Crossroads and we were looking at why church. And I kicked it off a couple of weeks ago with talking about why we gather in that large gathering. If you weren't able to, I, I suggest that you go back and listen to that message. The second message that, that we taught on is why we grow spiritually and how both of these gatherings help you grow spiritually. Now today, I'm gonna to zero in, laser focus on why we group. What is the importance of doing life with a smaller group of people for your spiritual development? That's what they did in the New Testament. So at Crossroads, we call that life groups. These are small groups of people who gather in homes to do several things. Number one, build relationships. Because a, a lot of times when we're at church, we don't have an ample of opportunity to develop relationships. We also wanna pray together. We wanna lift each other up very specifically. What are the needs? What are the things that we're going through? We wanna care for each other. What's happening in a person's life? In a person's life, we get to know people more intimately in that small group. And we want to grow spiritually through, as we read in Acts 2, through the teaching of God's word. In other words, we want to do our spiritual life together. We don't want to go solo. We don't want to be on our own. We want to be in a group that we can really be connected to. Now, let me say this. This model didn't begin with the church in Acts. It was actually modeled first by Jesus. So let me give you seven principles Jesus' life teaches us about small groups. 
I wanna show you the X factor. I wanna show you how Jesus, when he was on earth, literally exemplified the life of a person that is connected in a small group. So if you're taking notes, here we go, get ready. We're not gonna spend a lot of time on each point, but I think when we're done with it, you'll be more and more committed to a life connected to people giving you that, that life source that you need to grow spiritually. Number one, Jesus built his ministry on a small group. I'm gonna call this the foundational factor. I mean, this is really important. Like, this is what Jesus did when he came to earth, the last three years of his life, when he built his ministry, how did he build it? Did he go out? and look for 10,000 people to come and hear him? Did he go out and look at building a building? Did he go out and look at buying property? No, the Bible says this in Luke 6, 13, when morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them whom he also designated apostles. There it is. He took 12 guys and he said, I'm going to build my church on these 12 people. Now, let me also say that Jesus knew something about being a part of a small group. Hang in there. This is very important because the Bible says there was Jesus, there was God the Father, and there was the Holy Spirit. That's kind of like the eternal small group, right? The first group ever. We know that as the Trinity. But watch this. When Jesus came to earth, the small, then now he is instituting small group for what? The birth of the church. That's how the church is going to be birthed, through small group. So a small group birthed Jesus on earth. Jesus births the church through 12 men. And then the church in the book of Acts, which I just read for you, organized and met in homes to further the church growth. They... The, the church growth movement at that time was foundational. It was built on small groups. So here's my point. If Jesus saw it necessary for the advancement of the kingdom to build small groups, shouldn't the church today be focused on spiritual growth through small groups? Number two, Jesus engaged in small and large gatherings. And I call this the big fiction picture fact, uh, factor and the small picture factor. Let me explain that. Jesus wasn't against larger gatherings. Um, scripture in Mark 12, 37 says, how then can, it says, David himself calls him Lord. How then can he be a son? The large crowd listened to him with delight. So Jesus wasn't negating a large gathering as what we have on the weekend experience. It wasn't a negative thing to Jesus, but it wasn't complete. It wasn't all there was for spiritual growth. You know, we know that Jesus, Jesus taught in valleys. He taught on the mountaintop. He taught from a boat. He taught from a lot of different places where large groups gathered around him. But he spent most of his time with his small group. Number three, Jesus' small group facilitated the large group. Now, this is important too, because one of the things churches are struggling with always, every church I've ever been to, every pastor I've ever coached, they all have the same struggle. Number one is how do we train, develop, recruit leaders? Every church always has a short, I've, I've never ran into a pastor who said, I can't, I've got way too many leaders I don't know what to do with. So there's an issue there, but I wanna show you something because I call this the engagement factor. He said to his disciples, here's what he said in Luke 9, 14, and this is the feeding of the 5,000. He said to his disciples, have them come and sit down and put them into groups of 50 because he wanted to feed them. So what's happening here? So Jesus has his 12, but when he goes out, and he ministers to 5,000, that was 5,000 men, by the way, didn't include, uh, the count didn't include women and boys. So there's a lot of people there, right? So we've got this big gathering. So now he's got his disciples to help facilitate. He said, put them in groups of 50. One of his disciples brought him 
a little boy's lunch, which would later feed everyone there. So now what we see is in these larger setter, settings, his disciples are learning how to engage with people. They're learning what ministry is all about. I believe church, I, I believe there's a transition uh, in, in church right now. Not, not completely, not entirely, but I believe you're gonna see it the more time goes the way it's going. And that is this, there is somewhat of an entertainment factor and people are drawn to churches by what they can get and how they can be entertained. And I think it's gonna move from an entertainment culture to an engagement culture where people aren't looking to come just to sit, watch, and be wowed, but they're gonna come because they wanna participate, they wanna engage, they wanna enter in. And that's really what church should be. It should be where we are training throughout the week, we're, we're growing spiritually in our own personal devotions, and we're growing in our small group. And then when we come to a larger gathering, God's using us to engage with people. We're using our gifts and our skills and our abilities. So this is the engagement factor. Number four, Jesus spent the majority of, majority of his time with his small group. Now I've said this over and over, but I wanna repeat it because I call this the educational factor. And I, I, want, I want to point some things out. You know, his disciples called him rabbi. How many have heard that before, right? Rabbi, he calls, and, and rabbi means teacher. So what it meant was Jesus in his small group was teaching. So small groups are a place where we learn. It's where we are taught God's word. But I, I want to go a little deeper than that because Understand, Jesus did. Jesus was always teaching. He, was, he, taught, he taught his disciples to pray. We know that he taught, he, he taught them how to heal the sick. He taught them how to deliver uh, evil spirits. He taught them how to proclaim the gospel. I mean, Jesus is teaching them some pretty cool stuff and some stuff necessary for advancing the kingdom because we know there is a war going on between light and dark, good and evil, right? Right? So Jesus is teaching his disciples how to fight this good fight and he's teaching them all these spiritual dynamics. But what is really cool is that as they're in this small group with Jesus, he's teaching them primarily through stories. In the Bible, they're called parables. And it's like in the movie, The Chosen, if you've watched it, it's, it's really cool, isn't it? It's a really cool movie because they're always hanging out with Jesus and they're, they're just doing life together and all these these things are coming up in life and Jesus will stop and say, you know, let me tell you about a parable. Let me tell you about a story about a man or let me tell you about this or let me, let me tell you about the prodigal son. Let me tell you about the seed and the sower. And what he's doing in this process is he's teaching his disciples. It is an educational factor and that's what small groups are. They're growth times. Whenever I am in a group, my, whenever I'm in my small group, I'm always learning. I'm learning about the Bible. I'm also learning about how uh, somebody's spiritual life has affected them and how they've gotten through it. You know, think of, the, think of prayer. One, one of the uh, really cool parables I think of all time, for me anyways, I, I just find it humorous, right? It's, it's the the parable of the persistent widow. She has this great need, right? And she, she keeps showing up at the, the judge's door, knocking on the door. She's looking for justice, which is a whole interesting message on grace. But let me, get, let me just bottom line it for you. She's so persistent. You could say she's so nagging that finally the judge just says, please give this woman what she's asking for. That was a parable he was teaching his disciples on prayer. He's saying, be persistent. Don't just give up. And then he, he goes on to say, what? Ch -ch -ch knock and the door will be open. Ask, seek. He's teaching the principle of prayer, but he does it through these stories. And I believe that when people come together in small groups, yeah, they study the word, but guess what else? They tell a story. They might tell a story about how their marriage was on the rocks. 
But then Jesus came in and made a difference. They might talk about how their child was sick, but they prayed and they saw God heal their child. They may talk about how they were bound to, to addictions, but Jesus came and delivered them. And those are the stories that we resonate with because they're real life stories of the power of God. It's not just hearing it from the up front at the church. It's like being right there, looking in somebody's face, feeling their pain, their tears, their agony over that situation, and then experiencing the joy of God's deliverance. Well, I call that the educational factor. Um, number five, here's, Here's a great one. Jesus emphasized relational. Jesus' emphasis was on relational rather than organizational. All right? I, like, I, I know people have taught the leadership principles of Jesus, and I resonate. They're cool. But it's really hard from the New Testament to find where Jesus had this organizational plan. <laughs> His plan was people to get together with people, to hang out with people. And that's what he did for three years with his 12, with his small group. And in that, he emphasized to his disciples that this, this whole thing of the kingdom was all about relationships. And this excites me because I think the church really needs to go back to this being a relational component that we're doing life together. We're not just attending on the weekend. We are literally doing life together, breaking bread as it says in Acts chapter two, having a lot of things in common, coming together and helping each other out. You know, Jesus, there's a great encounter uh, where it's, it's the woman at the well, Jesus' disciples, all right, this really depicts the whole idea of organization first relationship. Jesus' disciples like, okay, we're hungry. We need to go in town to get something to eat, right? So they're all about getting something to eat. So they go into town. In the meantime, this woman, a Samaritan woman, which Jews and Samaritans don't click, right? Comes to the well and Jesus says, Would, you know, give me a drink as well. And then he does this whole discourse on living water. He reads her mail and tells her everything about herself and says, you've had a lot of failed relationships and the one you're in right now is not going really great and blah, 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 blah. And he ends up ministering to her eternal life. Wow. In other words, he, here's Jesus one-on-one -on -one finding out where a person is at and ministering to their heartfelt need. Wow, I love that, and I love that story. I call this, by the way, I call this the compassion factor. It's, it's, and it's, what I see in our small groups is there's a compassion factor to take people in where they're at. When we're in a small group, we, we're gonna come from different backgrounds, different walks of life, different experiences. And some of those experiences may be difficult or challenging or different than anything we've ever seen. But it's amazing how the gospel brings us all together, makes us all equitable. Nobody's better than another person in the kingdom of God. We have either received his forgiveness or we haven't. Here's what's interesting about this approach, because there's so much going on in the world today in terms of marketing and growing the church and all that kind of stuff. I'm not necessarily for it, against it. Let me just tell you something. When someone has their life changed, you don't have to convince them of much. When somebody sees the power of God in action, you don't have to convince them of much. And this, this woman, the Bible actually says, this is interesting, while the, <laughs> while the disciples were going to get something eating, I'm sure they were talking about how do we build the kingdom, Meanwhile, this woman goes in town and she becomes Jesus' biggest marketer. She goes around to everybody and says, hey, come and see a man who told me everything about myself, who, who talked about eternal life. Literally, that whole town was being set up by one woman because Jesus related to one woman. Let me go to number six. Jesus models. Okay, Jesus models 
to his small group, he models wisdom, knowledge, authority, attitude, behavior. I mean, you name it. He, he's modeling it. Now, does he teach it publicly? Yes. But that public teaching would be of no avail if he didn't live it. He allowed his disciples to see every, every moment of his life, every weakness of his life, and he modeled these key principles. I believe a, a small group and a life group is a great place to model real life. How many have ever come to church before? There's some smiley dude out in the parking lot waving you in, then you get in the th front door and there's a, some just beautiful people greeting you, blessing you, how you doing, praise God, hallelujah. And everything seems to be up and cheery and church can sometimes be a misrepresentation of where people are at. Not everybody's on a high all day long. Not everybody's smiley. And so in a life group, it's an opportunity to come in and say, I've had a rough week. I'm really struggling. I'm not only struggling with what I'm going through, I'm struggling with my faith. I'm not sure how to get through this. And I need my group to help pull me through this. You know, it, it, it is Jesus modeled life. I've, I'm thinking of when they came to arrest him. Do you remember that story? And we, we get a picture of where Peter's at because Peter takes his sword out and cuts Malchus's ear off. And Jesus kind of calms him down and rebukes him and said, Peter, put your sword away. And he makes a comment. He said to him, shall I not drink the cup the father has given me? What is Jesus doing here? Think about that for a moment. First of all, he's modeling what? Self-control. He's modeling the fact that you submit to God's will over your will. He's just modeling such a, a, a lifestyle that, that, that we can grab onto. And I call this the mentoring factor. Okay, it's iron sharpens iron. And I believe small groups are places where we can really engage and be mentors and be mentored ourselves. And I, 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 I like that because there's a lack of mentoring today. I don't believe there's a lack of hunger in the church. I believe there's a lack of discipleship. I believe there's a lack of mentoring. I believe there's a lack of willingness to take people with us on the journey that we're on. And I believe that life groups is one of the ways that we can do that. So let me just wrap this up with point number seven. Jesus used the small group for leadership development. And that is really, really important. You know, and I call this life lessons factor. How do I learn how to handle life lessons when I go through them? I have known people over the years to come to church, get excited about church, but the first trial that hits them, it knocks them off course. And Jesus even taught about that in the parable of the seed, right? Man, we take the seed, it's great, but it, there's no depth to it. So the enemy comes and steals it through hardship and persecution, difficult times. Life lessons factor. So remember when Jesus was in the boat, right? His disciples are following him. I'm sure this is a great ride, but all of a sudden a storm comes up. I'm going to ask you, how many know storms test our faith? This storm comes up out of nowhere and the disciples freak. Master, master, don't you care that we were perishing? Jesus gets up and what does he, he do? He calmly calms the storm. You know, storm, be still. But then he turns to his disciples and he says something to them. He says, oh, ye of little faith. It's very similar to Peter. Peter jumps out of the boat because Jesus is walking on the water. And as long as Peter has his eyes on Jesus, he walks on water as well. He emulates what Jesus has done. But as soon as the sound and the waves put fear in his heart and he looks away, he begins to sink. And Jesus said the same thing. O ye of little faith. Now, what am I saying here? I'm saying this. I'm saying that there's life lessons out there that can be learned in a life group. Here's what I know. 
Anything that you've gone through, anything that you're gonna go through in life, there's probably someone else that's gone through that. And it could be the people that are in your life group. Sometimes people face the report of cancer. I guarantee you there's somebody in your church, in your small group that's walked through that battle before. How did you get through it? Not just physically, but emotionally, spiritually, relationally. That's a life lesson. You know what? There's probably somebody in close relationship with Jesus that you could connect with that's probably lost a business, gone bankrupt, had a difficult financial season of their life. I guarantee you there are people in your life group that have lost loved ones. I guarantee that any difficulty in life somebody else has gone through, but when you have a group to walk through, you don't go alone. And that is what helps you through it. Being able to go through life's lessons with a support system and a group of people that truly care about you. So what's this message all about, church? This message is simply about this. If we're truly gonna be the bride of Christ, if we're truly gonna be the body of Christ, We need not only to come on the weekend and experience the celebration of the dynamic things that God has done in our lives, but we need a time too where we gather to grow in relationship, when we can pray intimately, when we can have questions that we have that that, that are not answered necessarily on that weekend service, answered, where somebody can walk through a difficult time with us We need a group of people like Jesus did who built his ministry on it. And what happened, it exploded because of his willingness to put his time into 12 men. So I wanna encourage you as we go through this series, Why We Church, to consider how you could be a part of a life group, how you could grow through one. We're we're gonna be launching life groups all across our campuses uh, in October. We've got a great curriculum lined up. It's gonna be a great season. It's a great opportunity for you to get in one. And I just wanna encourage you to do that. So I just wanna close in a word of prayer. And I wanna ask you to consider this question while I'm praying. Do you have a group that supports you on a regular basis for your spiritual development? Father, we thank you for the church. We thank you for the big C church. We thank you for the gatherings that we have on the weekend. But God, in the, in the New Testament, Lord, people met together in small groups. Father, in countries where it is illegal to be a Christian, groups meet underground all over the world. And some of those places, the church is growing faster than could even be recorded because when we do what the Bible tells us to do, we cannot be stopped and the gates of hell will not prevail against us. I pray now a blessing and anointing over crossroads as we lean into the calling, the calling that you placed on my heart that we become not just a church that has life groups, we become a church of life groups. And so I dedicate this message And I dedicate this season of growing life groups to you, Lord. You put your hand of blessing on it. You anoint it and you multiply it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Thanks for watching Crossroads Community Church online. We'd love to hear that you are here today. You can fill out our online connection card with your prayers, praises, and any questions you have at crossroadscn.com slash connection. Links are also provided in our bio. If you want to stay up to date, check out our website for upcoming events that are happening at your campus. Thanks again for watching. God bless.